Um, think about the return on the investment you get as a foundation when you give a grant to an organization. You know, say you give ten thousand dollars to a soup kitchen. <clears throat> what is your return on that investment financially? And most people say zero. You know, you give away ten thousand dollars, you get zero back. But actually, the return on the investment is negative one hundred percent because you give away ten thousand dollars and you don't get anything back. To have a zero return, you give away ten thousand and get ten thousand back. So, with an impact investment, even if it only earns one percent, or even if it only breaks even, from the perspective of the foundation, it's a good investment. Um, you've got nothing to lose compared to giving away the money in the form of a grant. And when you think of it that way, it really kind of turns the tables a little bit and, and makes it a much more intriguing idea to explore as a philanthropist or as a foundation. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. Hey everyone, welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We're super excited you guys are here and listening in on season four of the podcast. I'm really excited to have a a past guest on the podcast today, uh, David Miller. Uh, David has a storied background of work in the the Colorado community um, and has just been someone I've, I've just loved getting to know over the past uh, probably five or six years. So I'm super excited to have him on to talk about community development, the work they're doing at the Barton Institute and whatever other kind of trouble we're going to get into. So David, welcome to the podcast again. Uh, really excited you're you're hanging out today. Thank you, Ryan. I'm delighted to be here. And as I said to you before you started recording, I think it's really impressive to keep a podcast going as long as you have. So I'm delighted to be here for a second time. Yeah, well, it's we even were talking about some of the differences of of us moving to the season model, and I think our our last uh, the last time we recorded, you were I think it was like episode two or three, and it and it became a we we recorded so long and had so much to talk about that it became a two or three part <laughs> series, and uh, which is cool. But you know, that was pre COVID, or I guess it was maybe that was right when COVID was happening and everything. So I mean, the world has changed a lot, right? It's only been a a few years, but a lot's changed, and I know lots changed with you. So I'm I'm excited to press in on some of that stuff. Great. Well, I am excited too. So David, maybe um, just, just so people have a little of it, could you just give like a one minute overview of just your background and, and some of the things that you've done? And I think that'd be really helpful for people to kind of have a context of. Sure. I'm happy to do that. I grew up in Denver. I am a fifth generation Denverite, which is pretty unusual in this part of the country. I had great, great grandparents here uh, wow. well over 130 years ago. I went to Denver Public Schools and I've worked in all three sectors. I started in the public sector with various jobs in state and local government in Colorado. I then went into the private sector and had a consulting firm. Someone described it as an excuse for friends to work together. And then I spent most of my career in the nonprofit sector. I was the executive director of the Denver Foundation, which is the oldest foundation in Colorado. It's a community foundation serving Metro Denver. And about five years ago, when I first met you, Ryan, I left the Denver Foundation and started a new nonprofit organization called the Barton Institute for Community Action. And I imagine that's most of what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, I think it's, um, you made the point, like it's, it's, it's rare for someone, especially in Colorado. I mean, it's been a transient city, tons of people moving here. It's kind of rare for someone to have deep, deep Colorado roots. And then for them also to like work and work in making that a better place. You know, there might be people with deep Colorado roots and they're, you know, everyone's making it a better place, but they might be in business or things But you've been really closely tied to the community and, and how it's changing and how to make it better and how to serve those that, um, 
are, are, you know, struggling with, with certain kinds of things, homelessness, addiction, poverty, incarceration, like you've seen all that. So I just, I just think you have a really cool lens, you know, to grow up in the public school system in Denver, be here, grow here and be in that for as many years as you have. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool um, perspective that I don't, I don't think most of us have, you know, like I even just how I grew up on the Illinois, Wisconsin border is a lot different than how someone in Denver grew up, you know, and, and that's just going to change how you perceive the, the needs of the region or the city city. Yeah. You know, I think for me, it's not a coincidence. Uh, the fact that I have really deep roots in this community is one of the main reasons I am committed to giving back to this community. I feel like preceding generations gave me so many blessings and I want to try to give forward to future generations. Mm. Yeah. What, what do you, David, before we talk about Barton Institute, like what do you think is unique or different either for the good or the bad about Colorado? So like in, in Denver in particular, compared to other regions around the country, around the world, other cities, what, what makes Denver and, and Colorado special and unique? And what also are some of the unique challenges that you've seen? I mean, I'm sure you've sat at the table over the years with people running foundations and organizations all over the country. And, and I'm sure you've seen some differences. What, how would you highlight those things? Well, I could answer a thousand different things, but I'll just pick a few. Um, one of I have my two favorite things about Colorado are the climate and the people. Um, I think we have the best climate in the entire world. It can be 60 degrees in January, a week after or a day after a huge snowstorm. Uh, the sun shines almost every day here and not a day goes by that I don't appreciate the spectacular beauty we have been in our state. And the yeah. second thing I love about Colorado is the people. Um, it's often said that people in the West are more warm and friendly. And I really believe that I did live on the East coast for a while. And it's a big difference between the, the culture of the East coast and the culture in mm. a place like Colorado. So those are the the two things. I yeah. most well, like. One, one point I'll throw on and what you liked is I, I have to go shovel some snow later today up here in the mountains. So I'm, I'm a little mad at the climate right now, even though it's beautiful. Uh, but to, you know, I've always described Colorado as a place where like the Midwest work. Well, okay. Historically the Midwest work ethic and that Midwest hometown friendly niceness meets the progressive energy of the West coast, uh, where you kind of get a blend, like you go to California and it's a little different, uh, you don't have that much of that Midwest hometown, nice vibe, like holding the door open for someone kind of thing. And that's not to hit on, on California. Um, and you go to the Midwest and you don't have that like progressive kind of pushing the limits, you know, you don't have sectors, uh, a ton of sectors doing things. I mean, and I'm, I'm over stereotyping. There's definitely that there, but Colorado has been a really cool blend of those two. And I think, I think Montana is, is somewhat similar and just kind of the, this, I guess, Eastern part of the continental divide um, where that hits. So I, I've always appreciated that part about the people as well. Yeah, I think that's really true. And you know, when I grew up, Denver literally was a cow town and it's so much more interesting and cosmopolitan now than when I was growing up. And so I think the the influx of people from other places is by far a huge positive, um, but, it, but it's also the biggest challenge we face. I mean, literally in the last many decades, Colorado's growth has just been enormous and that creates huge challenges. Um, not the least of which is affordable housing and availability of housing and all kinds of other things that we'll probably talk about in the next few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are a couple of those? So to just kind of finish off that question, like a couple of the challenges that are, that you've seen be unique to Colorado for one reason or the other that you haven't seen in, in some of the other places. Yeah. I don't know if I'd use the word unique, but I think Colorado's biggest challenges stem from this rapid growth that we have experienced and are experiencing. And again, on balance, I think the growth is really good. We wouldn't wanna be stagnant or worse, right? but right. the growth brings with it a huge number of challenges, um, not the least of which are gentrification and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, I'm, in, I'm intrigued your thoughts on that actually for a second on just gentrification in Colorado. Um, 
I've got a lot of thoughts on that. I mean, living in Chicago for a long time, going to school at a, at a Jesuit school in Milwaukee, uh, inner city Milwaukee, which the Jesuits are notorious for dropping these um, <laughs> private high institutions right next to um, impoverished areas. And that's intentional on social justice, but gentrific like the gentrification uh, in Colorado over the past, maybe 10 to 15 years has definitely been interesting. And um, the, the way that, you know, like if I think about a city like Chicago, um, you kind of push out. So like the neighborhoods closer to downtown start to develop and that pushes out, you know, the cost you get further away from the city. That's kind of happened in Denver, but not quite. And there aren't neighborhoods in Denver that I'm like, oh, I, I wouldn't want to walk. I mean, I guess there are, but I wouldn't want to walk down there at, at one in the morning. Um, obviously there are some of those in Denver, but not the same way as there are in some other cities that I know where it's like that, that just wouldn't be super wise. What, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, on how gentrification has happened here? Um, how it's been a little maybe different than some other urban, urban centers. And yeah, I'd be curious your thoughts on that. Well, I'm not an expert on gentrification and I don't know a whole lot about other places. Uh, so I can basically only talk about experiences in Denver. But one thing I feel pretty strongly about is that growth is inevitable. I remember back uh, when I was young and kind of a, an extreme environmentalist, uh, there were these anti-growth movements in Colorado. Mm. And the city of Boulder s set some limits on how much they could grow. And you just can't do that, um, at least in a democratic society with a capitalistic economy, um, growth is going to happen whether we like it or not. And so yeah. I think the focus needs to be not on whether we grow, but on how we grow. And mm. if you look at it that way, you can make a difference and you can try to ensure that uh, people who have lived in their homes for generations are able to stay there as much as possible. And yeah. if gentrification pushes them out, then, you know, I think we ought to look at ways to try to compensate those people for uh, the suffering that they're going to endure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. And I love that perspective. Like it's not saying let's not do it. Let's not saying stop the growth or it's saying like, let's just do it in a way that preserves those that it might, might impact negatively, which is cool. And, and, and that's a great, yeah, it's a great transition into the, the Barton Institute. Um, why don't you, share a little bit uh, about what what that is. I and mean, we have the other podcasts that people can go listen to for a really deep dive on on what you guys are doing, but kind of what sparked you to start that, why that was even different for the move from the Denver Foundation for you. And then um, a little bit of the journey over the past couple of years and, and, and where you guys are kind of at today on that. Sure. Well, I'll keep it relatively brief and we can go deeper if you choose to in this podcast or some other time. And as you indicated, the first one, we... We spent quite a while talking about it. The Barton Institute is a nonprofit organization based in Denver. Its mission is to help create safe community spaces. And we have five or so programs that we're working with right now um, that in various ways help to create safe community spaces. They serve different populations. One of them serves single mother refugees, for example. Another serves people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, but they all have in common the desire to create what we call a safe community space. Love that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as you say that, I mean, a lot of the projects that you guys have, I think fit that. So, um, why don't you share a few of the projects that you guys have worked on and maybe a couple that are in the, in the pipeline and then we can go from there. Sure. Well, I'll pick two or three to briefly summarize, but, uh, Feel free to interrupt if you have questions or want me to go in a different direction. Uh, in no particular order, uh, one of our projects is called the Village Institute. It's based in original Aurora, and it seeks to serve single mother refugees. On the first, on the second floor of the building that they are in the process of purchasing, there are four apartment units occupied by four women who are single mother refugees from four different countries in Africa and Asia. So these moms live on the second floor in 
uh, one bedroom apartments with their kids or two bedroom apartments in some cases. Um, and then on the first floor is a childcare center. They are licensed for 70 little kids. And many of the moms who live upstairs work downstairs in the child care center. Oh, wow. So cool. It's a great little social enterprise. It provides housing for these four families, and it also provides jobs for the four families. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool model. Um, is it, it's is it because it's it's revenue gen i mean it's a it's a true social enterprise i mean it's revenue generating it's it's serving people it's giving them an employment that can work well um i'd be curious your thoughts like how does something like that scale so colorado i mean i don't even know how many refugees are coming into colorado every year or have in the past 10 years but serving for families obviously is super impactful and then there's a lot of work to do how, how do you as someone approaching that um, with your perspective, say like, okay, we got to make a small impact and do it the right way. And then we also know that there's a massive mountain to climb. And how, how do you, like, if you were coaching someone in that scenario, like how, how would you uh, approach that philosophically? Well, it's what I used to call at the Denver Foundation, the question of deep versus broad. And the Village Institute that I just described goes very deep. It only serves four families, but it is providing them with life-changing circumstances. It provides them with a place to live. It provides them with a job. It mm -hmm. provides them with career opportunities. It provides them with social interaction with other people who are facing similar challenges. So it's, it's changing the lives of four families, but yeah. it's only four families, as you point out. Right. Um, the opposite of that is to go broad and Really, you know, in that case, probably it involves advocacy and changing laws or doing things like that that will affect hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people. And there's no right or wrong approach to uh, social enterprise or, or to doing good work in any way. Uh, some people find it more fulfilling to go deep and some find it more fulfilling to go broad. And it's really hard to do both. Um, so to be honest, mm. I don't see that the Village Institute is ever going to be able to serve hundreds of single refugee moms. It's just not doable with their model. I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that they'll be able to serve a lot more than four, but yeah. it's not going to be 400 or 4,000. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. No, I, I love that answer. And I love your perspective on it. How, um, but, but at the same time, like, even though it's only four, you guys as a Barton Institute said, this should be a project that we focus on. All right. And so, um, that's interesting, right? Because you guys could have some, you could have certain KPIs or, or performance metrics that we hey, we have to serve as many people. We do that. It seems like you guys have a little bit of a, a flexibility, which I think is cool. Just kind of pick projects that are really meaningful and dive in. Is that is that true? Like you guys saw this one. I mean, clearly it wasn't. We have to serve a 500 refugee families in the next year, and then that'll create X impact. That really wasn't part of the puzzle for you guys, right? That is correct. Uh, certainly, I think it's important to measure things, but um, you and many of your listeners have probably heard the phrase that, you know, not everything that matters can be measured and not everything that can be measured matters. And I really believe that. I'm not suggesting that we ignore metrics and um, results and impact and all that, but it's not the only thing that really matters. And um, the impact on the lives of these four women and their kids is in some ways immeasurable and that's okay. You know, not everything has to be quantified. Yeah, David, that's, that's, uh, it, it's, it's cool to see that perspective. And I, um, I think it's something a lot of social entrepreneurs and, um, nonprofit executive directors and founders and CEOs, they, they'll always struggle with like that deep versus broad and doing it well and following their convictions to a high level in those things. And, um, yeah, I think it's just like a really cool, important thing. Uh, so tell, tell me about another project you guys are working on. Sure. It's called the Colorado Safe Parking Initiative. And this is one that really didn't exist the last time you and I talked on this podcast, Ryan. It is an organization that provides space for people who are homeless but own a car to sleep in their car safely at night. And most of your listeners are probably aware that <clears throat> excuse me, there are people in Metro Denver who um, don't have a place to live, but do own a car, and they try to find a safe place to sleep in their car at night. Well, this program provides 
uh, more than 100 people with that opportunity. We partner with churches around the community, and we now have 11 churches in many, many parts of the metro area, uh, Golden, Broomfield, Longmont, Aurora, Denver, et cetera. Uh, the churches provide safe parking spaces in their parking lots for people who have a car but don't have a home. And um, there is, we provide porta potties and lighting and running water for washing and security so that the people can live safely in their cars without fear of uh, anything related to their safety. And um, so it seems to be working really well. The churches are wonderful to work with. And often the um, congregants of the church will provide food for people and um, other assistance. And, um, you know, these are people who, in many cases, in most cases, have a job and they, um, yeah. they have an asset, they own a car. And so the hope is that they can stay there for a few months, save up their money, mm. and then have enough to make a down payment on an apartment and get back into permanent housing. Um, yeah. And for many yeah. people, that's already been the case. What an amazing project. And I remember us talking a, f a few weeks ago and uh, I, I was really intrigued by this one. Um, and, and so are they, are they long-term? Like, is it that the parking spot, the parking lot rotates by church every, every night or every week, or does each church commit to having it forever? And there's just always going to be someone kind of staying and living in their parking lot for this, for this season that they're doing that. How, how does that work logistically? Well, from the perspective of the, um, car owner, uh, there's no limit. So, you know, a lot of programs say, well, you can only do this for 90 days and then you got to move. Um, people are not kicked out. Um, the arrangements with each church vary from place to place. Um, in no case is it permanent because uh, neighbors wouldn't be happy if they knew this was going to be there forever. And so one of the keys to working with the neighborhoods and getting the neighborhoods to agree to these safe parking places is there's a time limit on them. And typically it's six months and um, okay. sort of seasonal, you know, from September to March to get people through the cold season. Yeah. But um, sometimes it's longer and often it'll be renewed for another six months if, if everything is going well. So it really depends. Yeah. That's awesome. And then, you know, um, I, I'm in the, we've talked about this a little bit, but I think it's cool for people to hear how you guys function. As you talk about that, you said, you said we a lot. Um, and, and with the village Institute, you said they a good bit. So I, I'm assuming there's different relationships that you have with different projects where sometimes you're supporting, uh, by coaching and doing a little bit of consulting and helping. And there's some, and I even know this just from talking to you, there's some that you're, you're really deep in it. And then there's some that you're kind of supporting. How, how do you guys balance that as the Barton Institute of, what is your role uh, in relation to these and in relation to their success? And is that different in different times? Um, how, how does that part work out? Good question. And we're still evolving the answer to that question. But uh, for the two organizations I've talked about so far, we are what's called the fiscal sponsor. And basically what that means is that we are a nonprofit, a 501c3 organization, and they are not. And so we provide all kinds of back office operations, back office services for those organizations. The, the people on their staff are technically on our payroll and we handle their accounting and bookkeeping and tax returns and payroll and benefits and all that stuff so that they can really focus as social entrepreneurs on what they're trying to get done mm -hmm. rather than worrying about the business side of it. Um, yeah. So, it's it's kind of odd. Sometimes I talk about it as we, and sometimes I talk about it as they. Um, <laughs> and in a sense, I should never use the word we because they're doing the real important work on the ground. Mm. And in another sense, I should always use the word we because uh, we're helping them to do their very important work. So uh, I kind of use pronouns irrationally, but that's the way it you is. You know, I can totally relate to that because I... And I, I actually catch myself sometimes saying 
we, uh, when I talk about some projects and they, when I talk about others, sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's subconscious. Sometimes maybe it's not going well and I don't want to take responsibility for it. I'm like, yeah, that's what, that's what they're doing now. Um, uh, subconsciously, which is an ideal, but, um, I think when you're coming alongside any organization anyway, whether you're a donor, an investor, uh, a fiscal partner, a consultant, a coach, a volunteer, to take that we mentality and really uh, come alongside them as part of their team, invested um, deeply in what they're doing and, and, and putting yourself out there to make it we, I think that just makes it a better engagement or relationship. And it challenges you to do it at a different level. You know, when you can keep it at an arm's length, it's, it's just a lot different. So I, I generally, I think we is, we is definitely uh, better. And I just thought it was a unique kind of nuance of how you guys function and work and an opportunity to explain that. Yeah, well, I agree with you 100%. And you were totally right. It was subconscious on my part, whether I said we or they. It's kind of funny. You know, I, I have been gone from the Denver Foundation now for um, six years. And I still refer to we when I talk about the Denver Foundation. And it's, it's been six yeah. years since I was there. But oh, you know, my, you heart, have, my heart is still yeah. there. Yeah, and you left quite the legacy there. So it's something that like a lot of what they're doing today is still impacted by what you've done. And that doesn't really go away. So that, that makes sense for me. Yeah, um, the other thing I would say, though, just before we move on, yeah. is, um, I, I don't want to be presumptuous in saying we, because I really believe, you know, the people on the ground are really doing the important work and the hard work. And I don't want to take credit in any way for what they're doing. So I, I want to be respectful of that as, as well as being a team teammate. Yeah, no, I think that's right. It's, uh, cause that, you know, and I think it's important if, if someone's ever listening to the podcast and discerning their role in this kind of world, like to, to discern like where they fit, because that on the ground piece is a lot different than kind of supporting at a distance, right? If you're on the ground every evening, if you're, uh, talking to folks that are and serving folks who are part of that, um, the safe parking initiative, like, uh, there's unique challenges and there's counseling opportunities and that's, it's just, a, it could wear on you, but it's what's needed. Um, and then during the day to be talking about the scaling impacts, the financial impacts or this metric or that metric, like you're kind of removed from the, um, it's still really hard and challenging in its own unique ways, but you're removed from some of the really weathering parts of, of, of what serving others on the ground looks like. And so, yeah, I think it's really important to know that difference. And it's something I have to remind myself often too, just, um, you know, the difference of, of what that looks like. And even when a, a client project shows up and they're not prepared or they didn't get stuff done and, and it's, you know, oftentimes it's because they had someone walk in their office or into their organization or this thing happened or that it, you really, um, you're inviting a tumultuous lifestyle and career when you're kind of on the ground day in, day out, doing that kind of like hand-to-hand -hand combat piece of the puzzle. Well said. One of my board members made a comment once saying that uh, a certain person is an extraordinary entrepreneur, but never turns in credit card receipts. And a lot of people that we work with are like that, which is just wonderful. I mean, we want people to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and we don't want them to have to worry about the details on the business side, but um, yeah. sometimes that's challenging for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a balance of being like, like being lazy to the operational functions and recognize and in that versus understanding its importance and recognizing it's not your skill set. It's like, I know some projects out there who are just, it's like, I probably need to like try a little harder to prioritize these things because it's important and see the importance. And then I know some out there who say, Hey, this isn't my skill. I want to know enough of what's going on in it, but I also recognize I'm not, I'm not good at that. And so I need to surround myself with people who are effective at doing those things. And so I think there's a way to approach that. And really that's, that's what we say all the time. We say there's, and I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on this, that there's we as a just general community, the business community and the nonprofit community and the social entrepreneurship community have said, if you're going to start a project, you have to be good at everything. And so we tell someone with a social work degree that wants to go do some project in, in Central Asia to serve people that they have to have CFO skill sets now and be able to know how to raise capital and go to get major funders or major impact investors and things. And 
yeah, we don't, most big corporations don't hire people to be that strong of a generalist. They hire people to be very specific for a reason and to understand their skill sets. And so um, it's, it's something that we've had to think about a lot and encourage people to say, Hey, you need to care about this and you need to understand it, but also don't recognize what you're good at and what you're not. And so I'd be, I'd be curious your thoughts as you've seen a lot of projects and social entrepreneurs and stuff like that, um, how you've perceived that. It's you what you just said is very well said. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's one of the arguments I make and others make for um, diversity and inclusion that you need to have different perspectives and you need to have people with different skills as part of a team. One of my favorite little stories mm -hmm. is this place called Bletchley Park, which was a big mansion mm -hmm. in, in England during World War II. And it was the site of where they tried to break the Nazis secret code. And they started, <laughs> as I understand it, by bringing in experts in code breaking and things like that in mathematics, and they couldn't break the code. And then they brought in people uh, who were experts in languages and linguistics, and they still didn't bring the, break the code. And finally, they, they stretched really far and they brought in poets, and they brought in um, people who were interested in totally different subjects and had nothing to do with code breaking. And only then did they break the code when they had people looking at this from 15 or more different perspectives. And to me, that's just kind of a great analogy for what we need to solve social problems as well. It's not going to be done with one group of people who have one set of skills. It's going to take a village, as they say, with every imaginable skill. If we're going to successfully address hunger or homelessness or healthcare or whatever it might be. Mm, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a cool story mixed with that too. And, uh, <laughs> and an important visual, I think that people can latch onto, which is really cool. All right, everyone, I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about Impact Foundation, who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. Well, what if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing in their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. Um, what, what do you, um, let's, let's kind of go a different angle for a minute. Um, why, from your perspective, I mean, why, why is social enterprise so important to solving the challenges we face? So, I mean, 30 years ago, even 15 years ago, and in some ways 10 or five, uh, social enterprise hasn't always been a, a big sector. And in, in some way it's still growing. And it's kind of like the wild west where you ask one, if you ask a hundred people on the street, what social enterprise is maybe five will know the definition. And that would maybe be a generous percentage. Um, and, and two, it's like the five that know what it is are going to define it differently and, and that's okay. But w just big picture, like why, why is it so important and why you as someone who spent your career in all those sectors and, um, I spent time at the Denver foundation, you know, um, doing a ton of work with a lot of nonprofits, some that probably didn't have an earned income stream. And now to kind of focus this portion of your career in the Barton Institute, a lot of it being on social entrepreneurship in, in certain ways. Um, and some of it not, but like, why is social enterprise so important to the future of how we just deal with the big global challenges that we face? Great question. Um, here's my answer. Having worked in all three sectors, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, I have come to believe passionately that no one sector can even come close to solving any of our big social challenges. Government can't do it alone. Business can't do it alone, and the NGO nonprofit sector can't do it alone. It takes all three sectors working together to 
have any chance of addressing some of these big problems that we face. And it's kind of the um, macro version of what we were talking about with individual skills. We need the skills from each sector to help address these problems. And so my definition of social enterprise, and you're right, everybody has their own definition or <laughs> many people do. It's just, it's kind of the, the overlap of uh, business and social service or the overlap of mm. what business does with what government and nonprofit organizations do. And mm. in a way it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, you could think back for probably a hundred years to like a museum gift shop. You go to a yeah. museum and after you see it, there's a little gift shop before you leave. Mm -hmm. That's a social enterprise. Um, right. right. And, you know, they sell posters from the museum and it raises money for the museum. So it's, it's yeah. not a new concept, but the way it's being used in all kinds of creative and exciting ways is what makes this a really burgeoning enterprise, mm. I think. And I'm, I'm really excited about the many social entrepreneurs, uh, not just in Denver, but worldwide who are really trying to uh, break new ground by bringing um, business mm. concepts to social problems and vice versa. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I, I love that museum gift shop example. It's uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use that more often because I'm always looking for the, <laughs> the kind of simple example. I usually use a soup kitchen as kind of, Hey, there's not really any way to use a revenue generating thing on this for a typical soup kitchen. Um, and then, you know, you've got kind of that next level where, you know, like a museum gift shop is perfect of, and yeah, we look at it as a spectrum and it's, and it's interesting. My definition is usually a utilization of the global economic marketplace for social good. And I would add what you said to that, you know, um, by having an overlap of the, the business and the nonprofit sector in a unique way. So it's, um, again, it's, it's part of the cool thing about it being the wild west is there's not really a fully right answer. It's like, wow. And, and I, I wanted to stay that way because it's not a black and white thing, you know, a uh, Patagonia as a company is doing great work and they look way different than the nonprofit museum with the gift shop, but they're all utilizing this kind of mentality to become more sustainable and, and push it further. And the convictions that every founder, CEO, executive director has on what that should look like are different. And, and that's a beautiful thing about human nature is our convictions are different and that's what helps us work on, on different projects, which is cool. So yeah, thanks for sharing some of your, your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I'll just add one more thing quickly. Yeah, um, go ahead. I think another really important piece of that puzzle is government and um, mm, government mm -hmm. also, I think needs to be at the table um, when we're doing this kind of work because of the, scale involved. Um, if you take all the money, I did the math when I was at the Denver Foundation, so it may have changed a little bit, but if you take all the money that every foundation in Colorado gives away in a year, it would fund state government for eight days. And th if you wow. took all the money that every foundation in Colorado gives to education, it would fund the Denver Public Schools for six mm. days. And wow. so I think the role that the nonprofit sector can play and especially foundations is to take risks that government won't take and to demonstrate the effectiveness of, of certain programs or projects and then see if government will take them on and because mm -hmm. government can take things to scale in a way that NGOs cannot. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. I, you know, fun, an interesting example of that is we have a marriage ministry in South Florida we work with and they, um, they have, let's see, they've done the math that there'll be like uh, 86 something thousand divorces in Broward County and in, in the Fort Lauderdale region in the next 10 years. And it's a, it's like a $31,000 societal cost. And, and we talk about it. We, we actually recorded a podcast episode with them. That'll be part of season four. I don't know if it'll come out before this one or after this one. Um, but you know, maybe before or after whatever, for people to have a context with the point being, you know, we talk about it. It's like $31,000 societal cost per divorce. And that could be uh child's child support that needs to happen. That could be counseling for kids that come out of that, that it's an issue that could be, uh, 
subsidies and TANF and things where you now have a split income and people can't really like afford on their own. So they need some government subsidies. And so that's a two point with the $86,000 divorce, 86,000 divorces and 21 or $31,000 per divorce projected in 10 years. That's a $2.6 billion societal cost. Wow. And their organization, their goal in the next 10 years is to basically have programming throughout the community that can help teach on these things and help strengthen relationships and marriages and how people approach that um, by working with the business community, the government community, schools, all sorts of things. And um, they will, they, their goal is to save 26,000 of those divorces from, from becoming an actual divorce. And so they can associate a cost. And we were talking about, I was thinking about you because of this, you always bring to the table that, that government angle, which I think is really important at reminder that, well, man, if it's going to cost, let's say it costs $20 million for this organization to do this work and the government were to invest 20 million on the front end into that organization and it's going to save them, you know, X, X, uh, 2.6 billion divided by four. So math is hard, but somewhere around half, just, you know, $750 million or something like that um, per uh, for that. I mean, to invest 20 million to save 700 million or so would be a massive win for the government, but getting that kind of mindset and thinking is, is really challenging. But I just thought that was a really interesting example of, and seeing how, what you're talking about could, could play out for that. I love that example. I'll give you one of my favorite examples, which is a, a little different, but um, you know, the, the data is overwhelming about the importance of preschool, especially for kids from low income families and, and how much it yeah. helps them. <laughs> Uh, when they go to kindergarten and beyond in terms of learning how to read and other things. Well, a foundation in Denver uh, funded a study to provide preschool free of charge for four-year-olds. And after several years of showing the results that the kids who went to preschool did way better than the kids who didn't when they got to K through three, um, there was then a ballot issue in Denver to raise the sales tax to provide free preschool to every four-year-old in the city who needed financial help. And the voters of Denver approved that. So now I don't remember the numbers, but it's something like $30 million a year of wow. taxpayer dollars go to provide free preschool to every four-year-old in Denver. And wow. for, from the city's perspective, it's a great investment because over the long term, it's going to save money. But if the foundation hadn't kind of funded the pilot project, it never would have happened. Mm, yeah. Well, and that's, that's why I'm excited that folks like you are representing those, those foundations and getting it at the ground level, because you're all the projects you're talking about doing, you guys are piloting those and you guys are proving that concept. And then you as an individual have a lot of those relationships to make that happen um, and connect some of those dots, which is really cool. So we just, we need more Davids and Barton Institutes doing a lot of that work um, and, and proving that concept, which is, which is really cool. Um, I guess the last thing that I wanted to kind of throw out there um, before we wrap up here, was just kind of the role that um, similar to social enterprise, but what, what your thoughts are on the impact investing landscape. Again, another thing that feels like the wild West in a sense, and you've got the ESG model uh, with, with the, you know, stock market and looking at publicly traded organizations, you've got uh, venture capital and private equity company and firms now looking at um certain impact oriented pieces and, and what that's going to look like uh, versions of that that say, are they just taking good care of their employees versus are they investing in the community? Like maybe Patagonia is with climate change um, and all the way to debt, to, uh, debt impact investment to a nonprofit organization that there's really no exit strategy or profit dividends, but it's really a, a different model than traditional philanthropy. So I'm just kind of curious, like as you're seeing this landscape change, some of your thoughts on impact investing and where it's heading and, and maybe what the space needs and some of that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, I'm very excited about impact investing. I think it has enormous potential. I'll um, briefly describe something that my friend Steph Gripney has told people if you're on the foundation side, which is um, think about the return on the investment you get as a foundation when you give a grant to an organization. You know, say you give 
$10,000 to a soup kitchen. <clears throat> what is your return on that investment financially? And most people say zero, you know, you give away $10,000, you get zero back. But actually the return on the investments is negative 100% because you give away $10,000 and you don't get anything back. To have a zero return, you'd give away 10,000 and get 10,000 back. So with an impact investment, even if it only earns 1% or even if it only breaks even from the perspective of the foundation, it's a good investment. Um, you've got nothing to lose compared to giving away the money in the form of a grant. And when you think of it that way, it really kind of turns the tables a little bit and, and makes it a much more intriguing idea to explore as a philanthropist or as a foundation. Um, that said, not every nonprofit organization can handle or use impact investments. Just as you were saying, Ryan, that a, you know, a soup kitchen probably can't um, generate a whole lot of revenue by selling products or like a, a museum gift shop can do. Um, so it's not for everybody and it's not gonna be the um, cure-all to end-all. But I still think there's huge potential for impact investing and all of its variations um, compared to what we're doing now. I think it's really just in the early stages and it's it's going to explode in growth in the coming mm -hmm. years. But it will not replace philanthropy and it will not replace social um, corporate social responsibility or, or other things. It needs to be a, a tool in the toolkit, but yeah. not the total solution. Oh man, I, I love that response. And I'm going to, I'm going to snippet that uh, quote from, <laughs> from this podcast and use it, use it uh, often. Cause I totally agree with you. And I, um, and I, on every level, uh, it isn't the end all solution. Um, but it, it can be a better stewardship of, um, of resources to do it that way, to basically recycle those funds. And again, we're still going to need to give that to the soup kitchen and that, that has its place. And, but we also can challenge some organizations to think about what fiscal self-sustainability should be for them and, um, and challenge them to think outside of the box and grow and mature that way. Because there are organizations that I think are leaving some on the table like that and just kind of relying on traditional donations and philanthropy. And so it all has a place and it's really special. There's a lot of work to do uh, there to talk to foundations and traditional philanthropic donors about that concept and to kind of move them to maybe using a percentage of their, their giving in, in the impact investment space. And there's also on the other end of the spectrum to go to traditional investors and say, hey, like, have you guys thought about um, more of an impact generated blend and, and everything in between. So I'm, we're really excited about that space and I, I appreciate hearing all your thoughts on it. And overall, David, it's, it's always fun to have a conversation and hang out with you. I, I really value and appreciate it. And I'm, I'm thankful you joined the podcast today. It was a lot of fun. My pleasure, Ryan. You are a great interviewer and I loved talking to you and I'm happy to do it again anytime. And there'll be more, more partnering along the way. So I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be back on the podcast at some point. So yeah, thanks for joining David. My pleasure, Ryan. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, we would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. 
You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal, tax, or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Beast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, and Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal, federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.